am so grateful. Good morning, heart and soul. I am so very grateful for the way that we have, um, and this isn't new, this, is, this shift has been in place for a while, the way that we begin with our devotional, that we, that we slow the pace enough so that we can literally practice the presence, which absolutely changes everything. And I think for those folks who, who practice this, and this is just their way of life, that they wouldn't, wouldn't dream of beginning a thing without pausing in prayer and in meditation and centering themselves, then they probably don't know the difference. Because it's just their practice, you know what I mean? If you're, if you're fully hydrated all the time, then you don't know what folks are experiencing health-wise who aren't doing that. And so I am grateful that as a part of our Sunday practice and often in other meetings and sessions that we, we begin in a devotional with an energetic pace that allows us to experience the divine personally, to practice the presence, literally. Oh, I love that. So grateful for that time and the prayer and where we land in it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, heart and soul. Thank you, heart and soul, for summer school. Can I just say that? Oh, yes, indeed. So this Wednesday, can I just say, if you, ha if you have been a part of it, then you're like already a part of it and you know. But if you haven't, then I'm just going to say you can still get in on the last little drop of the good stuff. You know, and don't trip, don't spend all the time tripping about how you wish you had been there at the beginning and from the beginning and all that. Just get in on the part that you can get in on. And that would be this Wednesday, because this is our final session. And it's special um, because the author will be with us. And so this is just, frankly, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I can hardly wait. And uh, he has some energy around it and all of that. So it's a, it's a very, very good thing. So if you haven't been paying attention to or, or you're just joining us now and you like, what author, what, where, when, how, what you talking about? I'm talking about The Four Pivots by Dr. Sean Jinwright, Imagining Justice, re I'm sorry, Reimagining Justice, Reimagining Ourselves is the work. And we still have some books available. So if you are interested in getting a book, we just ask that you make an immediate additional donation. This, whenever I say this, I feel like we're on PBS during a little call in. If you just, <laughs> we'll send you a book. If you just make a do minimum donation of $20, because it's all nonprofit work. So, and I want you to know that whether you have the book or not, if you put your camera, uh, your phone up to the screen now to capture that QR code, you can experience a bit of his energy with a video that he um, created about it to introduce the book, if you will. So here's, here's our map. The first pivot was about awareness, and that was lens to mirror. This idea of, you know, when we look through a lens, often it's magnifying. It's making whatever we're looking at larger and we get to see all the blemishes and that gives me an opportunity to just clarify just how that's looking in detail. But he's suggesting as a point of awareness that we look into the mirror. I'm just pausing so we can breathe that in, that rather than looking out always, solely, that we do some inner looking as well, that we look at who we are and how we are and the perspective from which we look through a lens. And then he took us to this experience of connection where we were looking at the distinction between and frankly moving from transactional relationships to transformational relationships 
where often, and some of the prosperity class work that we have done, you know, just speaks to that some of us are in relationships that if it wasn't about the money, we wouldn't be in that relationship. Or if it wasn't about the convenience, if it wasn't about something that is very transactional, that's not a relationship we'd even be in. And so the opportunity is to transform from the mirror perspective our lives in a way that our relationships are more transformational. Does that make sense? That, yeah, let me just leave it there because you need the book if it's not. Because he goes into detail. It's about connection. So the third pivot um, the one that I spoke of last week is about vision. And it's about seeing, shifting from a perspective of a problem to a possibility. And part of the work that we did, as I shared with you, is some what if work. You know, looking at the quote problem and then doing some what if. What, what if it wasn't a problem? What if instead it was a possibility? What if I saw it through? What if that was the vision that I held for, the perspective that I had for it? And then, last Wednesday and today, we're focused on presence. This notion of moving from the hustle, from the frenzy, from the just getting it done for the sake of getting it done often, from the energy of that really kind of embedded in this idea of hustling, of being in the frenzy, is that my worthiness is tied up into, is tied up in my accomplishment. That if I'm not doing something, you know, and some of us in our family of origin, you couldn't just sit around. What you do? Oh no, there's some dusting, there's some, there's some dishes, there's some something you could be doing. You know, and if there aren't chores, you need to be reading. Just just kick back. I don't know what you think this is. <laughs> Do something. I know you got some homework. There's something about, so we, we have kind of baked in a sense of our value and our appropriate, our best work is work. Some kind of work some kind of busy, and the way that translates, I think, when it gets out of hand, is that we are addicted to the frenzy. We're often busy for the sake of being busy. You know, when we kind of have cleared the, you know, we got a little space now because the call canceled or the meeting is canceled, and, you know, that can be, that could freak some people out. You know, what am I going to do with that 45 minutes? And so this is evidence of this sense of frenzy. And so he's talking about us moving from the frenzy, moving from the hustle to the flow, to the ease, and I would add the grace. And so I love that he's called this uh, presence because, you know, I started by talking about us, us practicing the presence. And that's what this notion, I believe, this notion of flow and being in the flow is really about acknowledging and honoring presence, divine presence. So what is flow? In the four pivots, Dr. Sean Jin Wright says that flow is the state of consistent, focused, and nearly effortless activity that consistently produces desired results. This is you getting it done without the struggle, without the frenzy. Flow is the state of awareness that is free of judgment, doubt, fear, and confusion. And it's guided by a sense of effortless certainty. When I, if you're not there, this is like an infomercial, isn't it? It's like, how do I get some of that? This, is the, this reminds us that there's another way to be and do and have. He says that flow is actually a concept that's been practiced for thousands of years. In Taoism, it's practicing the way. It's the being still. It's allowing it to unfold. It's trusting the process. In African and indigenous cultures, he says, 
it promotes, those cultures rather, that promotes social harmony and values or behaviors that achieve it. Flow is found not so much as an individual person accomplishing a challenging task, but in the harmony of groups of people effortlessly working together. And we know that there are many African cultures and indigenous cultures and that are, are founded on the community, that that's where the main value is on us, on we. And this notion of I that's very Western in its approach is not valued. It's not, it's not a special thing. We kind of train ourselves to see ourselves and what about you? But from those cultures, it's less about me, it's about us. What I'm doing is for the greater good. What I'm doing is in response to all that has been done for me. Some of the early research on flow focused on, on artists and how you could, you could see a painter who could just get lost in time and space and not even be aware of being hungry. We see that across the arts. We see that, think about musicians, you know, how, who are maybe in a jam session and they start off with, you know, a few common chords or whatever and then folks just are, and we see them transport it. We don't know what to call it, but we see them leave the conscious, intentional playing of any um, expected note. And instead, they are the note. They have become whatever the instrument is. And that's the flow. They call it also being in the zone. Now, you do not have to be a professional artist or have that even as an avocation. You don't have to have any of that going on because there's not a one of us who hasn't experienced it, maybe even washing dishes, where you look up and you're like, oh, my good, where was I? <laughs> you know, you were so, you were just transported. You were no longer focused on the tongues of the fork or the scrubbing of the pan. You were in the flow of, of life, in the presence of the divine. This is why Brother, oh, one of the monks, I'm, I'm missing the name right now, and it doesn't, it's not essential for the telling of this, but often you find that in, in those kind of, of communities that, that are designed around supporting folks and going more deeply into an experience, uh, more deeply into practicing the presence, that there will be the chores, and the chores are done in a way that it is spiritual work, that you know you're not just washing the pots. You are practicing the presence. You're not just dusting the altar and the sanctuary area. You are practicing the presence. You're not just waxing the floor. You are practicing the presence because it brings a certain sacredness, a certain sanctity to whatever the activity is. Yes. I know sometimes... Well, okay. Um, Part of this being in the zone that, that we know we see with athletes, we know that, that Steph Curry is not counting dribbles and is not getting to a point and, you know, getting his knees just so and feet with shoulders and this, all of that is already done. He is in the flow. That is one fluid move for three points. Yes. And with, with such consistency that you know that it doesn't include the analysis. It doesn't include that part of the brain even engaging in how will I get over there and get just to the right angle. It is just him being one with the ball and the court and the people on it. All of that, yes? It's the presence. And in that, we are 
the interesting thing of, it, it's almost um, paradoxical. That's not the word I want. It's, uh, there's a word, but I'm missing it right now because we are, are in this oneness, so our awareness is everywhere. And at the same time, we are unaware of time and our surrounding. And yet we're so deep in it that we're, we're one with everyone in it. You know, I know sometimes like, like even in a Sunday talk. Now see, I'm... <laughs> Okay, so what happens sometimes is I don't always want to say what, I'm, what I get to say, and this is that moment, and I'm trying to see if I can get a pass. <laughs> <laughs> but it hadn't arrived yet, and it don't look like it's coming. <laughs> so sometimes when I'm speaking, it's like I hear questions or I hear... I hear... I hear thoughts that are, not, that are not my thoughts. So it causes what it does for me, it has me maybe explain it in a different way. Back in the day, I developed a pra practice of just stopping and asking people because I could hear a question. I could literally hear that this isn't landing as completely. I never expect that everybody's going to get it, but I guess maybe there's like a critical mass or, or maybe it's just blowing up so for a person. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but I know that that's how, how it manifests. And so I, I lose... Tr See, in that for me, I think I'm telling this because... Aha, thank you. Because it's an example of of it moving from me kind of in my talk and what I know and what I'm thinking I'm bringing to there's something else that like others are contributing to the talk through their own wondering or through their own understanding. Like sometimes I'll get to a point and I'll feel like that ain't a point I need to share right here, right now, and can move on. And other times it'll be different. So there's something about how, what's going on in this zone. And there's something that, that heart and soul is, is up to, in a sense, because at the level of our board of trustees, our leadership, and our Ignite Circle, and our Ignite Circle, just so you know, is comprised of those individuals who are leading other circles. And so we come together you know, monthly to do our work. But this is the research on this um, flow says that groups develop this. When they align their thinking and align their values and align their intentions, they develop a flow. So we are actively engaging in some of that ourselves so that we can be ever more effective, ever more present to heart and soul, and all that we intend to be. Yes? All right. And this is essential because Howard Thurman reminds us that, or suggests that we not ask ourselves what the world needs. You're just out there doing what you think needs to be done, but instead, ask about how you be. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. What is it that when you're engaged in it, you are more often in the zone than not? You know, some of y'all would be cooking doing that. Some of y'all would be knitting and sewing and doing things that others of us, it would, we'd be like, you do what? But for them, do you understand that this is not a thing that needs group approval? But when you do it in a group, when you're quilting in a circle, when you're knitting in a circle, when you're praying in a circle, when you're singing in a circle, when you are connected with folks and aligned in the practice, you call forth the divine presence. So I just want you to know that your leadership is engaged in that because we, this doing that we get to practice moving from problem 
to possibility because that's what happens in these groups. It's, a, it's the mastermind concept without the details and the specificity that a mastermind typically has, but it's the, the energetic presence and intention of mastermind work. It's the energetic, it's the collective energetic would be a way to say it. Dr. Sean in the book says that justice and freedom are not the absence of oppression but rather they're the ability to truly create the type of world we envision. So, see, I love this, but here's what I know. We won't get there unless we align our intention. See, I'm still having the same conversation. I'm still talking about the same thing. This vision, when we become aware that what we must really call forth is not just less oppression, not just less racism, less sexism, less misogyny, less, 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 less. That ain't it. It's calling forth the divine principle to be actualized in our lives. In order to do that, we must have cut a groove in consciousness for that. So the way he says it is, it's the ability to truly create the type of world we envision. The way that Centers for Spiritual Living says it is we envision a world that works for all. And in order to do that, we must concentrate that energy practicing the presence around a world that works for all, not like magic. There is that that we must be to cultivate. We must be about cultivating the flow. To stop. To pause. To breathe, he says. And look, part of, a huge part of this work is in our imagination. A huge part. I just want to, you know, invoke Neville and the masters who, who really said you got to you got to start in you to begin to see what it inward, see inside what you want to see outside. So on Wednesday, part of one of the activities that we did during our uh, summer school session was working with the sentence stem that today I create more flow by. And there was this phenomenal moment where folks just popcorned up and shared what, their, what that, that sentence stem was for them, completing it. And it was so powerful. Now, there's, there's a song that the lyrics of which say, Imagine me loving what I see when the mirror looks at me. Because I imagine me in a place of no insecurities. And I can forgive me. This is our work to begin to imagine, to begin to see ourselves in, in another consciousness, in another awareness with, with other possibilities. That we don't have to wait for the problem to be so heavy. We can come in the present moment and begin imagining me being free. This could be part of our mirror work. Loving you, Andriette, totally. Imagine me loving me. Sometimes I tell you it's the producer in me that just can, can see how to weave it together in a way that, that, you know, this mirror work we've been doing on Wednesday. If you're part of summer school, you, you better know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you, now, if you're not in summer school, you get a clear pass. Because otherwise, we've been doing mirror work for two weeks now. And my prayer is that it becomes a part of how we be and what we do in order to, to engage our imagination in ways that is helpful. So I, I love that song and the way that it, it meets us with this notion of, each one of us beginning to imagine ourselves in ways that we, that we never have. Because we've been largely accustomed to using the mirror to just get clear about the criticism. 
you know, just, I need to see what's wrong here. And often some of us don't go until somebody's looking at you like, and you go, well, let me go see what, oh God, you know, and off you go. So you use it to find out what's wrong. And this mirror work is using it to discern all that is there, the infinite possibility. This is a way of moving what from problem to possibility in our thinking, what's possible for me to be, for me to do, and for me to have. Imagine me in a place of no insecurities. I'm going to suggest that this become our mirror work, the one of our mirror work theme songs. We may be putting together a whole playlist, though, just, you know, I don't, I don't want you to feel like you ought to just etch that into granite and think that's going to be done. You want to leave some space because we're going to be developing what is it that supports us in getting there and getting there all the way. So, look, I have, I have some bonus mirror work for us. So I'm skipping ahead, as you can tell here. Uh, some bonus mirror work for us. And... It's because, and we've given folks, the assignment for summer school is we've given you um, some sentence stems to use. And what's true is you can, you can begin doing your own. But here's what we're working with right now, and I think it's, no, 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 go ahead. It's the bonus one. It's the last slide that looks similar to that. That's what I meant. I'm, yeah, there you go. So our bonus mirror work is to spend time daily in the mirror, affirming using this sentence stem. I see you, I love you, and I forgive you for. Just be with that right now. We're just going to do a quick little practice session. You don't have to say anything aloud, but you're just going to practice for your later mirror work. I see you. I love you, and I forgive you for. And the way we've been doing this is for five minutes. So you would just continue with that same sentence stem for five minutes. However, it just allowing it, you know? And for many of us, the experience that we have is that the first minute or so is kind of your throwaway stuff. You know, it's your pat answers. It's the stuff you've been saying. And then they get to about, about minute three and a half. About three and a half, you, about to, you start excavating some stuff. Some stuff starts showing up. You're going to need to maybe have some tissues handy or something. You know, I don't know. Because it's, it's really, there's a point at which where the work is doing you. You started out doing it. And now it's doing you. And revealing what must be known in this. So look, we can forgive. Bishop Tutu, who, if you know anything about him and the work that he did in, and the way, his contribution, I should say, to post-apartheid, pre, and po I mean during apartheid and post-apartheid, you know that it was the forgiveness work, standing in this, this holding holding the presence for forgiveness. So he says, to forgive is not just to be altruistic. You're not doing no big thing for the planet. He said it is the best form of self-interest. He says what dehumanizes you inexorably dehumanizes everybody. He says forgiveness gives people resilience, enabling them to survive and emerge, still human despite all the efforts to dehumanize them. So this is our work. This is our inner work. Of course, we can all see who you need to take the photo for and of the slide and pass it on, but I'm going to say just pause. Just pause on your community work. The, and not have this be that. Just act like this is me giving you a little personal note here. This is not for you to distribute and have to post and, you know, be thinking about all the people who really need this message. Oh, Rev, I wish they were here. Where can they get the video? This ain't that. This is you scheduling your time with the video. This is us realizing 
what's ours to do. Bishop Tutu um, says that he often, or, or wrote rather, in one of his books that um, he used to refer to an old film, The Defiant Ones, and it's with Sidney Poitier and Tony Curtis, and they are manacled together. And so they're convents, and they escape from the chain gang, and they are chained together. So in this scene, they fall into a ditch, and the ditch has slippery, sli slip slippery sides. <laughs> And one of the convicts clawed his way up to the top, you know, going to get out, but you can't go without the other one. If the other one can't get up there, you ain't going either. And that's just a moment. Now, if you're just watching the movie and it's just entertainment, you probably miss that connection in terms of the greater message, the deeper message. You just see folks sliding around in the mud and you just, ooh, that's not going to... But the larger message he's saying is that the only way they can make it is together. And so this idea of, and for us, you know, our theme is adventure in faith moving forward together. And so this is a call for us to look more deeply at what's before us. And it probably means that we need to draw from what Dr. Sean said, which is to stop, to pause, and to breathe. That sometimes we literally have to slow down. We have to stop before we can move forward. And we're committed to moving forward together, so our leadership is, is kind of pressing pause a little bit to just see how are we going to move together? How are we going to be? in the most empowering way, in the way that can touch the most people in the best possible way and be in the flow as a state. You remember how we defined it? As a state of consistent, focused, and nearly effortless activity that consistently produces the desired result. That's, that's, our, that's our intention. And the question, of course, is how are we going to get there? Well, a part of it is, is we're going to be in forgiveness. We're going to begin by forgiving ourselves. This is why I'm giving you this bonus mirror work. Do some self-forgiveness. Because that always just opens our heart. So that we splash some forgiveness on others in the process. You know what I mean? If we're forgiving ourselves so much, we just dripping with it. Others get at least damp with it. This idea of being willing to, in our mirror work, say with meaning, I forgive me. Everything that I've been holding on to, I let go. Why? Because I can't flow while I drag stuff around. I surrender. Lord knows I'm ready for my change. I want to set up the closing prayer because I was touched by a prayer that one of my colleagues wrote. And then I kind of, when I thought I was going to bring it verbatim, I ended up adding some stuff to it. But I want to begin with this quote from Ernest Holmes. Ernest Holmes says, I contend with none, argue with none, and am filled with wonderful peace and light. There is no uncertainty about my future and no fear as a result of my past. I live in the eternal now, which is filled with good alone. Goodness and beauty follow me. Peace and joy accompany me. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Happiness and wholeness fill my entire being with this realization of love and perfection. I love this because it reminds me that I'm not limited by my past or my present circumstances unless I agree to be. Unless I'm willing to be limited, I have to kind of deal myself into the lesser game. Or I can 
invoke, as Howard Thurman, Dr. Howard Thurman says, to keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. Those moments when I knew better and I affirmed better and I declared better when my mirror work was top game. And then sometimes I forget and I fall into the quagmire of doubt and shame and guilt and confusion. But in this moment, I offer for myself and for everyone within the sound of my voice this collaborative treatment that I know and I know that I know that there is one source, the living one, the strong one, one creator expressing itself as all creation. All creation is, is divine creation. So it's all divine, everything, everywhere, everyone, everywhere, all the time, every situation, every circumstance, all creation is spirit in form. And knowing this, I speak my word. And as I do so, I do it with the power of truth of the divine expressing in and as me. And no distraction can dissuade this conviction. Because I know, and I know with total confidence, that I align with Dr. Holmes' declaration. There is no uncertainty about my future. There is no fear as a result of my past. I am grateful, Lord knows I'm grateful, that I know I live in the eternal now, that I am in the flow, in the flow of all good in the flow of divine love. I know that this eternal now is filled with good and very good. Goodness, mercy, beauty, and grace imbue my life and attend me everywhere. This is how I know that there is not a spot where God is not. Because wherever I go, whenever I look up, I see the divine clearing that I know is the presence of the divine. It is an absolute, absolute certainty that I know that this, this prayer covers, surrounds and enfolds the entirety of our lives in a way that Whatever is unlike the truth and the light bubbles up and is cleared away. It dissipates out of our willingness to imagine another way, another day, another me, another life. And that my forgiveness work clears it all up clears the field so that I have divine and perfect access to all that is intended for me. That I am no longer withholding from me divine good. I know and I know that I know that God never did. If anything was withheld, it was my own withholding. It was my own sense of non-deservability. It was my own sense of worthlessness, my own sense of shame or guilt or blame or whatever it is that I would put between me and my highest and best. And so that's over. And I know that what is true for me is simply true. So it's true for anyone who would claim it. And so it is an absolute deep gratitude in knowing that this is so, that I release this word, that I release it into the perfect activity of law, which I know is love. And I know that this unfolds in absolute perfect form and perfect order. And for this, I am grateful. I simply let it be by affirming Ashe, amen, and so it is. Love truly matters.